so far we've learned about mainly how solids uh, move. Um, we looked at acceleration and velocities. We did forces. Uh, and then we started doing energy. Then we did rotational motion. And all of those things were related to how solid objects uh, move. So now we're going to transition away from that a little bit and talk about fluids. So this week we'll talk about statics for fluids, so fluids that are not moving. And then next week we'll talk about fluid mechanics, so when fluids are moving. So we've talked a little bit about fluids already uh, when we were talking about stuff like drag or air resistance. And we said that was when a solid object moves through a fluid and we defined a fluid as either a liquid or a gas. And the thing that is, so there are differences between liquids and gases, but the thing that's similar about them that lets us group them together as fluids is that uh, they both, uh, they don't have a definite shape. And that has to do with the molecules or the atoms that make up the liquid or the gas. Um, not really, they interact with each other, but in a different way than solids interact with each other. So if you get further along into physics or chemistry or maybe biology, you'll learn more about that. So then for reference, so solid is not a fluid. And that's something that has a definite shape. And of course, different elements or molecules can be any of these phases of matter. So So that's whether you're a solid, liquid, or gas. So right, water can be liquid, so it can be a fluid. It can be a gas when it's water vapor. or it can be a solid when it's ice. And we'll talk about this, these kind of transitions more when we talk about heat and uh, that will be a little bit later. And this is also something that you'll see in chemistry uh, dealing with these different phase transitions. So one of the properties of any type of matter is density.
And we represent that with the Greek letter rho, which is kind of like a squiggly looking P. And density is defined as the mass divided by the volume. So density is an inherent property of whatever element or material you're looking at. And so what I mean by that is if I have one cup of water or one gallon of water, the density of both of those things is the same. So it doesn't matter how much of something you have, the density of that thing would be the same, at least for a fluid. Uh, we'll talk about density and gases a little bit later. Right, so if I have one cup of water, or if I have one gallon of water, this density is the water is 10 to the three kilogram per meter cube. This density is 10 to the three kilogram per meter cubed. So density is just a property of some material. So if you asked me what color gold was, the answer would be gold, right? So that's just a property of that material. So it doesn't matter how much water you have, the density will be the same. Now, <clears throat> if the right-hand side of this equation, or the, sorry, the left-hand side of this equation is the same, then if you look at the right-hand side of the equation, that means that if my, for example, if my mass goes up, then my volume also has to go up. Or if my volume goes down, then my mass has to go down. And so if we look at this example that I drew over here, obviously one cup is less volume than one gallon. And so the cup of water is gonna have less mass than one gallon of water. And that just makes sense intuitively, right? If you tried to pick up a cup versus if you picked up a gallon, one is heavier than the other. Okay, and then I showed you already now what the units for this are. So the units for mass are kilograms and the unit for volume is meter cubed. You might also see things written as grams per centimeter cubed. And that equals a one milliliter is equal to uh, one centimeter cubed. So this 
is milliliter. This is centimeters. These are grams. And so a liter is just another unit that is sometimes used for measuring the volume of something. So if you look at, if you go to the store and you buy a two liter of soda, that's what it's measuring. That two liters is a measure of the volume of the liquid in that container. So we'll mostly work in kilogram and meters cubed, but just so you are aware, there are these other things that units can be measured in. And uh, one of the reasons that I bring up grams and centimeters cubed is that, uh, maybe I'll do that on the next slide. So water is obviously very important for humans and for life in general. And so we, you might ask, where did we come up with these things like kilograms or grams or liters? And so one, so the, the density of water is defined as one gram per centimeter cubed, which is one gram per milliliter. And so if you make this definition, then you can figure out now what is the definition of a kilogram or what is the definition of one gram by using the density of water. And so just as an aside, uh, we also use water to define our temperature scales. So for Celsius, the boiling point of water is set to be 100 degrees. And then we set zero degrees to be the freezing point of water. And then everything in between there, uh, we'd base off of those two uh, points. So this method of using water to define our measuring systems is pretty pervasive throughout physics and other uh, sciences. So any questions about density? Yes. Yeah, so if you if you're comparing two of the same type of thing, then they will always have the same density. Oh, so it, it depends on the, the type of chemical. So for example, water has this density, uh, but another liquid or another thing that's a liquid at room temperature is mercury, and that has a much higher density. So it depends on the type of chemical that you're measuring. Any other questions? Okay. Then we will move on to talking about pressure. And so we represent pressure with the variable capital P. And so there's a couple of different ways to think about pressure. So one way is if you apply a force to some area, then you get a pressure.
So you can't escape forces. We'll be talking about them all through this class and all through physics too as well. So one of the examples that you can see for this, so if you took So if you have a person, I guess if you have two people, and one person is pushing on the other person with their hand, and let's say that's some force of 10 Newtons. And I don't know, the area of your finger is some, some area, let's say pi r squared, where the area is what? Or the radius is one centimeter. So this is, this capital A is area. So pi times 0 0.01 squared. Three point one four times ten to the minus four meters squared. So that would give you a pressure of three one eight three one. And then the units for this would be Newtons divided by meters squared. Yes. I just so. I just guessed and said that this was the radius of my finger. So I'm this first example, I'm just kind of poking someone with my finger. And then in the next example, let's say that we're, so this is finger, and then in red, we'll do like a needle. So we all had to get vaccinated. So the the area of a needle is much smaller than the area of your finger. So if we wanted to find the pressure that a needle would exert, let's say we use the same 10 Newtons of force. And we use the radius of a needle, which is 2.5. Eight six five times ten to the minus five meters, and then you plug that into your calculator and you get
2.58 times 10 to the minus nine meters squared. So now you would get a pressure of 3.87 or 3.88 times 10 to the nine Newton per meter squared. And so that is a lot higher of a pressure than if you just poke someone with your fingers. So the, the takeaway here is that even if you're applying the same force, if you concentrate it into a smaller area, then you can have a greater pressure. And so that's why if you poke someone with, the, with your finger, you're probably not gonna break their skin, but when you use a needle, you stab through the skin and then you can inject whatever useful medical stuff you need. Okay, so that's one example of say using a solid object and exerting a force on another solid object under some area. So now let's relate this pressure to uh, fluids, which is what we're talking about now. So pressure and fluids. And so one example that we can use, so if we look at a so for example, a car tire. So this thing is filled with some kind of gas. And in order for this thing to keep its shape, What's happening inside is that the gas, I'll do it in red. The gas is exerting pressure on the surfaces of the thing that it's either inside of or in contact with. And that pressure is what maintains the shape of this object. So the red arrows are pressure. And so pressure pushes perpendicular, perpendicular to the surface. And so one way to think about pressure is if you apply a force to some area, you get a pressure. Another way to think about it is if you have some pressure in some given area, then you have some force that is pushing outwards. So anytime you have a fluid inside of some container, you'll have some pressure and that pressure can in this example, maintain the shape of whatever it's inside of. Yep. Right. So if you if you let the air out of the tire, then it would no longer have this round shape, right?
And so another, so we talked about pressure and it, if we use these two variables, then the units are Newton divided by meters squared. And as we'll see in a second, uh, there's a scientist who did a lot of work with this topic. And so he gets a unit named after him. So his name is Pascal. And so the units for pressure are Newton per meter squared or a Pascal. So these are the two standard uh, units for pressure. Uh, you'll see other units for pressure like PSI, which is pounds per square inch. So your your tire your tire pressures in your car probably say like. 30 PSI or something like that. And so that's what that's a measure of. We probably won't use that in this class. And then when we talk about weather or meteorology, you might see something measured in bars or millibars, or you might see something as atmosphere or atmospheres. So those are also units of pressure. So if you see something that is a Pascal or a PSI or bar or atmosphere, then that's your clue that they're talking about pressure. So something that you might know or that you've probably experienced is that the pressure can change. So density was something that was constant for that object, but pressure can change based on where you are in the fluid. So if you think about flying in an airplane, uh, when you go to a really high altitude, the pressure goes down and we'll talk, we'll see why that is in a second, uh, but the pressure goes down and you can feel it in your ears when pressure changes and your ears pop, or if you've ever gone, uh, like scuba diving, then the deeper you go down, the more pressure you feel. And so why is that? Uh, we'll derive that now. So this is the pressure of a fluid. And so we'll do it in a cylinder, but we'll see that it doesn't matter what, uh, it doesn't matter what the container is. So here's our cylinder. There will be some, it has some height. And it's filled with some fluid. And so if we want to know the pressure of the fluid, we need to know the force over the area. And so if this is a cylinder, then the area of the cross section of this cylinder is just pi r squared. And so we'll say that this cylinder is sitting on the earth somewhere. So if I wanted to look at, let's say some slice of fluid in this cylinder, uh, what force is gonna be acting on this, on the water in the fluid? Gravity, right? So there's some gravitational force that's pulling down on this fluid. 
And we know the force of gravity is um, G. So if we replace the force with mg and then the area with pi r squared. Now, the only thing that we don't know is the mass of the water. But we know that we just learned that the density of water is some constant, and that equals mass divided by volume. So you might remember this trick that we did in one of the problems that we worked in the PLTL session. We take the, we replace the mass with the density times the volume. So now we have pressure equals density times volume times G over pi R squared. So now what's the volume of a cylinder? So you take the cross-sectional area and you multiply it by the height. So the volume of a cylinder is pi r squared times the height. Okay, so now you see that the area uh, showed up both in the denominator for pressure and in the numerator from the volume. So those two areas cancel out. And you're left with the pressure equals rho, which is the density times G times H. So this is the density of whatever fluid you're in. This is gravity or gravitational acceleration. So 9.8 meters per second squared. And now H is the height in the fluid that you are in. Or I guess I should say the Okay, we'll, we'll talk about that conceptually on the next slide. Uh, but so does everyone understand the, the substitutions that we did in this process? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we started from this formula that we just saw, right? Pressure is force divided by area. Then we replace the area with the area of a cylinder. So this is the cross-sectional area. So for a cylinder, that's just a circle. So we replace that area with pi r squared. We know that the there's gonna be some gravitational force acting on the fluid because it's on the earth. So we replace that force with mg. What's that? Right, so then volume came in from here. So we don't know what the mass is, but we know that mass is related to density and volume with this equation. So then I re we replace the mass with density times volume. Then we know that the volume of a cylinder is pi r squared h. And so we replace our volume with pi r squared h. We got our pi r squareds to cancel and then we're left with rho gh. We don't have what? Uh, I mean, you would, you would know what the fluid would be inside of the container. So yeah, you would, either be given or you would know how to get the density. Okay. So 
if we look at this conceptually, so we have two, two examples. So So we have an underwater example, and then we have a in the air or in an airplane example. So underwater. The, I guess so I'll draw one. So this will be person two, and this will be person one. So if we compare the these two people, so person one only has this much water above them. And so the weight of that water is going to be, we'll call it W1. For person two, they now have this much water above them. So we'll call that W2. So there's more water above them, so the, the force of the water above them will be greater. So W2 is greater than W1. And so if you plug that into your pressure equation, and assuming that the, the surface area of these two people is the same, uh, then you would get that the pressure on person two is greater than the pressure on person one. So that's why as you go deeper under the water, there's more water above you that's pushing down on you. So that makes the pressure under, the further you go down in the water, greater. Then the opposite is true for the airplane, right? So if you are sitting on the airplane versus being on the ground, person one, person two, so for person one, there's all of this air above them, but for person two, there's less air above them. So for person two, the weight of the air for person two is less than the weight of the air above them for person one. And so the air pressure that person one feel or person two feels is less than the pressure that person one feels. These these two things are the same. I just maybe I can label them. So maybe this should be person two, and this should be person one, just so it's this. It looks the same as the other thing. So the, the situations are the same, right? They're both at different heights in the fluid that they're in and having more being towards the top of the fluid means that there's less above you. So there's less weight that's pushing down on you. Okay, so one more thing uh, when we're talking about pressure and fluids is called Pascal's principle. So this is the same person that the unit was named after. And this is a very important result. And let me draw a picture.
So the pressure in a closed system has to be the same. So if we look at the pressure in this cylinder versus the pressure in this larger cylinder, these two pressures have to be the same. The pressure in closed system. Same. And so if I have some thing that I can apply a force to, F1, and this thing has an area A1, then this other part is free to move, and we'll call that A2. And if I push down with some F1 over here, then this thing will have to move up at some force F2. And so what I've basically drawn here is kind of a, an idealized hydraulic system. And this thing that has some area A1 that I'm applying the force to is called a piston. And so what Pascal's principle says is that because this is a closed system, oh, and then the inside of these, uh, the system is some fluid. So we know that pressure is force over area. And so now I can apply, so if, and just by looking at these two pictures, we know that area two is greater than area one, right? And so that means if I, let's say I give you a force an initial force F1 of 10 Newtons. Will force two be greater than or less than force one? So if area two is bigger than area one and this fraction has to be true or this ratio has to be true, then force two has to be greater than force one. And so using this system, you can apply a small force to some small area and get a bigger force applied to some bigger area kind of for free, right? This is a pretty powerful thing uh, and we use it all the time in our everyday lives, so. So maybe next time we can work a more complete example than this. And then there's a few other topics uh, that we need to finish up for fluid statics.